The L.C. Waldo was one of many ships that were stuck on the Great Lakes by the 1913 storm. The storm had several nicknames, including the White Hurricane. Many of the men who survived the storm would simply call it the worst storm they had ever seen. As for the men of the L.C. Waldo, they would say it was a very close call. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Having visited these archives for a year, I realized that I have never asked you for your own favorite. Do you have any suggestions? Of course I have a favorite. May I recommend the brave rescue of Elsie Waldo? In 1869, Representative Halbert E. Payne from Wisconsin introduced a bill for the formation of a United States National Weather Warning Service. The terrible storms that hit the Great Lakes were one of the main motivating factors. By 1913, telegraphs would go out to the harbors of the Great Lakes, telling in advance that there was going to be a storm, and advising the flying of storm flags to warn captains of any impending danger. For the captains on the Great Lakes, Seeing storm flags in November was nothing unusual. It was the month of storms. In 1905, a howling November storm had wrecked 21 vessels beyond repair and cost 60 lives on Lake Superior. It would later be discovered in inquests into the wrecks that many of the captains trusted their own judgment above the weather warnings and had headed out into the lake in spite of them. The Weather Bureau found little improvement in this attitude from captains on the Great Lakes seven years later. Though a warning to small crafts had already been flying in Duluth Harbor at 10 a.m. on November 7th, it was upgraded. The storm signal now fluttered in the growing wind. A storm was coming from the southwest. A few cautious captains held off on leaving port. They would be grateful for their decision soon. Not even the people who issued the warning had any idea how serious the storm was going to be. Weather equipment was not advanced enough yet. All that they could tell was that a low-pressure area from the Carolinas and a low-pressure area from Canada were on a collision course. The two systems would merge right over Lake Huron. The L.C. Waldo left two harbors two hours before the storm flags were raised. They had no warning of the impending disaster. Even if they had seen the flags, it would not have prepared them for the wind's swift shift from the southwest to the west to the northwest, and then to the north. The shift of the wind to the north around 3 a.m. on the morning of the 8th brought with it whiteout blizzard conditions. Vessels on the lakes endured 90 mile per hour wind bursts and 39 to 35 foot waves. Though Lake Huron would be battered the most, on Lake Superior, conditions were almost as bad along the coast of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where the L.C. Waldo was still trying to fight through the waves. Captain John Duddleson had personally supervised the construction of the L.C. Waldo in 1895, and he had been the captain of the 4,244-ton steel bulk freight steamer ever since. He and his ship had seen their share of storms. In 1905, they had been the last ship to see the Kaliuga before she was lost in a gale off Thunder Bay Island. Now, Captain Duddleson was forced to decide which route would bring himself, his crew, and his ship to safety. If they ran for the Keweena Peninsula, they might be able to shelter behind one of the small islands until the weather calmed, but that was 45 miles away. He was standing in the pilot house with his second mate and the wheelsman discussing their options when a giant wave suddenly loomed over the stern of the ship. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison confirmed that Lake Superior has rogue waves, 
also known as killer waves, in 2015. Though people who have sailed on the Great Lakes have told stories of them for years. When waves are averaging 8 feet, these waves will get as high as 17 feet, and they show much greater force than the waves around them. In a storm as severe as what the L.C. Waldo was in, it can only be imagined the force that the wave came down with. Captain Duddleson and second mate Figure both saw the wave coming and ran for the shelter of the companionway that led to the captain's room. The water was soon rushing over them, but they were the lucky ones. The wave carried away part of the pilot house and most of the Texas. The steel deck of the compass room was bent and the compass was smashed. The front of the ship no longer had electricity. The wheelsman they had just been standing with was ripped from the wheelhouse and fell to the deck below. Once on the deck, he managed to grab a hold of something to prevent himself from being washed overboard. Once the wave had passed, Captain Duddleson and second mate Feeger went to check on the wheelsman. He was injured by his fall to the deck, but he was not in any danger. The pressing matter now was how to manage the ship. They were in serious danger if they did not bring the ship back under control. Up in the wheelhouse, the wheel was too damaged to be usable. They would have to come up with something else. In the ship's now damaged lower wheelhouse, Captain Duddleson took control of the ship's emergency steering apparatus. On a stool next to him, he set a compass from a lifeboat, and he read it by the glow of an oil lantern. He could not be entirely certain where they even were. Visibility was now so bad that he could barely make out his own vessel's smokestack. He believed that they were near Manitou Island, meaning he still had a chance to go between Kiwina Point and Gulf Rock, and then shelter behind the Kiwina Peninsula until the danger had passed. While the crew struggled to even shovel coal into the furnace, the steamer fought forward with waves continuing to crash over the aft of the ship, as well as the already damaged wheelhouse. Almost half of the time, the ship's propeller was out of the water, meaning they had to throttle down after each wave crest covered the fantail. It was hard work, but there was no time to rest. The waves were not done with them yet, though. Around three in the morning, the rudder stopped responding. Most of the aft cabins had already been smashed by the terrible waves, as had most of the upper works of the vessel. The crew in the aft of the ship made their way up to huddle in the bow. With them, they brought the two women who were along as guests, the cook's wife and her mother. Both women had expected a pleasant end of your cruise, and had become petrified with fear as the weather turned from bad to worse. They were not experienced sailors, and the men who clawed their way forward through the ice, snow, and wind were forced to carry them while also clinging to the wire cable railing that ran the length of the ship. At four in the morning, Captain Duddleson could hear the waves on the rocks before he could see them. No longer able to try to control the vessel, there was nothing that could stop the collision. The L.C. Waldo was driven by the waves bow first, hard onto the rocks of Gull Island. Only a little to their west was Kiwina Peninsula. It would later be discovered he had been within half a mile of his reckoning, in spite of the conditions he was in, a tribute to his years of experience. The same experience caused him to give the next order as well. If the ship slipped off of the rocks in these conditions, they would sink, and it was likely none of them would survive. Launching lifeboats was out of the question. Even if it had been, the storm had stripped away all of their lifeboats. They were prisoners on the ship. Calling to his engine room, where the engine crew had remained at their stations, he gave the order to his chief engineer to flood the engine room 
and bring the crew to join the rest of them in the windlass room. The extra weight at the stern of the vessel would keep the ship from slipping and putting them in a worse condition than they already were. As they passed through the galley, which was also in very poor condition, one of the engineers thought to grab a couple of tins of what he assumed were vegetables. It was later discovered one was peas and the other was peaches in syrup. These meager supplies would be all they would have to eat between 24 people until they were rescued or they froze. Chief Engineer Albert Lembke was later credited for being the reason that they survived. As the stern sank and the ship began to break in half, they needed to come up with a way to keep warm without the electricity or heat usually provided to the ship by the engines that were now underwater. Taking the captain's bathtub from his room, the chief engineer flipped it upside down and then had the sailors kick the bottoms from fire buckets, piecing these together into a chimney that connected to the bathtub's drain hole. Chief Engineer Lemke was able to create a crude stove with a vent out of a nearby port. It was not large enough for all of them to be around at once, so Captain Duddleson split them into two groups. They would take turns between warming at the stove and keeping warm through exercise and gathering wood for the fire. Soon, they were chopping the cabin wood to keep it going. They had no idea if anyone even knew they were there. There are different versions of who initially reported the wreck and how. The story that follows is the most commonly told version. The steamer, the George Stevenson, had fought through the same storm that had been the downfall of the L.C. Waldo. On the morning of the 8th, the George Stevenson had fought her way to the shelter behind Kiwina Point. The shelter offered them enough security to anchor, though the snow was still so blinding that they could not see anything. Still not comfortable with the conditions. Captain Mosher of the Stevenson stayed on duty until midnight that night, finally feeling as though he could rest. He therefore most likely was not pleased at first, when the first mate woke him up at dawn to inform him that a steamer was aground about 13 miles away on Gull Rock. The captain and mate decided to edge their ship a little bit out into the open water again to get a closer look. It was hard to tell if there was anyone on the stranded ship. She was entirely encased in ice and seemed as still as a tomb. Then they spotted her distress flag fluttering in the wind. There was still a chance that no one had survived the wreck, but they felt compelled to still let the authorities know. The mate of the Stevenson stepped up to the task. He took the ship's lifeboat and rowed to shore then hiked, in still blizzard conditions, the eight miles to the town of Delaware, where he made a phone call to the Eagle Harbor Life Saving Station, wanting to make sure that the frozen steamer, whose identity he could not even tell the Life Saving Stations, was certain to receive help. He also put in the call to the Portage Life Saving Station. Two crews now began to mobilize, in spite of the terrible conditions that were still present on the 9th. The Eagle Harbor station was closest, but they had a problem. Their 34-foot motorized lifeboat was the one most likely to survive the voyage in such poor weather. But unfortunately, the motor had broken on it. This meant they were going to have to go in the small surf boat instead. At 2.30, they headed out. One local resident was quoted as saying, You better wire Washington. Those boys are never coming back, as he watched them leave. They were about eight miles into the stormy lake before life station keeper Captain Tucker was forced to admit that they were not going to make it. He and his men reluctantly returned to their station. Both themselves and their boat were encased in ice. When they returned to Eagle Harbor, they were frozen to their seats. They had to be helped from the boat by family and friends. Reports say it was something that required the use of small axes 
Captain Tucker immediately gave two of his men the order. They needed to get the motor fixed on the lifeboat as soon as possible so they could try the run again. In the meantime, pieces of the pilot house from the L.C. Waldo had been found by a commercial fishing vessel and reported. The worst was feared for the L.C. Waldo and the people on board of her. The only people who knew where she was was the George Stevenson, which kept its vigil on the frozen wreck. They could not get near to effect a rescue themselves. The rocks and waves were still too rough for any equipment that they had on board, but did not feel right to leave her when they knew there were people on board who needed assistance. Much of the time, the people on the Stevenson could not even see the Elsie Waldo because of the heavy blizzard, but they still did not feel as though they could leave her. Finally, on the 10th, the George Stevenson was forced to surrender and depart. They had done everything they could do, but even as they left, Captain Mosher was worrying about whether or not help would arrive, or if it would be too late by the time they did arrive. The L.C. Waldo was entirely encased in ice. It did not seem like something anyone could be alive aboard. At 3 a.m. on the 11th of November, the lifeboat engine was running again, and Captain Tucker immediately launched it to head out once more into the storm. At 7 in the morning, Captain Tucker and his men reached the L.C. Waldo at last. In the meantime, the crew of the Portage Life Saving Station was also struggling to come to the stranded ship's aid. They had decided to take the longer route, since it was more sheltered, and the storm was still raging. They did have the help of the tug, the Daniel Hebert, though, which took their boat in tow. Though their lifeboat was a self-bailing boat, the hole kept plugging up due to the ice, so it had to be repeatedly chopped clear. Their voyage took them 14 hours in total, and when they arrived, it was 3 in the morning. The conditions were still rough, and the night was dark enough that the crew decided to wait until dawn to effect a rescue. It was hard to make out anything. They sheltered behind the point until dawn. When the Portage lifeboat came alongside the L.C. Waldo at last, the crew was not able to come rushing to greet them. Rocks were rough enough around the boat, the waves were choppy still, and there was little shelter. A voice from the L.C. Waldo shouted for the people on the lifeboat to stand off a ways for safety. The people on board the L.C. Waldo needed to chop through the ice to leave the windless room, and that was going to take some time. While the people from the portage station were standing by, the crew of the Eagle Harbor station arrived as well. Both boats looked the worse for their voyage. Once the people on the L.C. Waldo had freed themselves from the ice, the rescue effort was able to start. The portage lifeboat loaded the first ten men off of the boat and then pulled away, and the Eagle Harbor lifeboat took its place. The Eagle Harbor boat rescued the twelve remaining men, the cook's wife and her mother, and the ship's dog. All of the survivors were transferred to the Daniel Habard, which had stood by under the shelter of the point. There they were given warm clothes and fed, and they could finally rest. In total, they had been frozen into the wreck of the L.C. Waldo for 90 hours, with only a fire in a bathtub for warmth and two cans of food, between 24 people. Amazingly, no one was seriously injured or harmed by the entire ordeal either from the L.C. Waldo or either of the life-saving crews. The Eagle Harbor crew even stopped by another wreck, that of the turret chief, to ensure that they were not in any danger before they returned to their station. It was only once they had returned to their station that they discovered some of the metal plates of their boat had been crushed in by the force of the storm. When asked about the whole experience, Captain Duddleson of the L.C. Waldo would simply say, It's the closest call I ever had in all my life. He could be thankful to have survived the fury of the storm, though not everyone was so lucky. In total, 
an estimated 250 sailors lost their lives during the storm of 1913, and ships all over the lakes, with the exception of Ontario, were either wrecked or stranded. Things were not entirely over for the L.C. Waldo. Though Captain Duddleson was forced to admit that his ship was a total loss, she was salvaged in 1914 and sold to an Ontario shipping company who named her the Riverton. In November 1943, she wrecked again, this time on Lottie Wolf Shoal, and was again declared a total loss. In 1944, she was refloated and sold to a Quebec shipping company, which this time named her the Mohawk Deer. She was finally sold for scrap in 1967 to an Italian shipbreaker. On the night of the 7th, 1967, 50 years after the start of the storm that ended her career as the L.C. Waldo, she broke free from her tug and stranded in the Gulf of Genoa and broke in two. She would eventually be recovered and brought into the shipbreakers. The strength and destruction of the 1913 storm stuck in the public memory and added to the many stories about November on the Great Lakes. The Charles S. Price was found in a major shipping lane of Lake Huron flipped upside down. In some cases, wrecks from that storm that have been found over the years also flipped upside down. There is a theory recently put forward that suggests that the instability of the coal cargo that many of the ships carried during the storm is to blame. The raging storm damaged the ship's hatch covers. Then, water would have seeped into the cargo of coal and caused air to be trapped in a pocket under the coal, at the very bottom of the ship. The ships were already being tossed on the waves. Even such a little thing could upset the entire balance of the ship. It is hard to tell exactly what happened to many of the ships that disappeared. There was no one left to tell the tale. Only one message in a bottle was ever found, a letter saying goodbye to his family from one of the men who went down with the Plymouth. In more modern Great Lakes history, the dates around the 1913 storm hold a more recent significance. On November 9, 1975, Another terrible storm blew onto the Great Lakes. When it was over, it was discovered that the giant ore freighter, the Edmund Fitzgerald, was no longer above the water. Another sunken ship brought about by the storms of November. For more information about the 1913 storm and the ships that found themselves on the lakes in it, please see November's Fury by Michael Schumacher, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.